All right, folks, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, as promised, we'll, we'll start with a bit of, uh, of review and practice with uh, when it comes to energy and phase change. Um, talk with some quiz questions. Uh, and then we'll, we'll start looking at um, atomic theory and some of the evidence that, that led the early, um, early chemists, the chemists before that chemistry was really a term, um, to, to put forth the, the hypothesis that atoms existed. Um, we'll look at some of the actual experiments they do, because I think it's, it's pretty cool that these, these folks back in the um, 16 and 1700s found ways to measure things that they couldn't physically see. Um, so, and then it, we'll get into how that shapes the periodic table and how electrons and orbitals work if we have time. Likely we won't get to electrons and orbitals until we get to uh, next week in all, in all honesty. Um, but it's always nice to, to uh, be ambitious, right? Um, this first question about how do new elements get created or found? Um, we will talk about that when we start talking about the atomic structure in more detail, because basically the, the answer is um, use particle accelerators to smash stuff together really, really hard. Um, and sometimes if you do that hard enough, you get a new element out of it. Um, some questions about uh, genetics and then some questions about cooking. Um, so this second question I think is really interesting because it's um, specifically this, this person was asking about in real time, meaning not genetic modification before an organism is born, um, but after an organism is born, after um, the, the body is developed. And there actually is a technology that they're looking at um, is being considered for that called gene therapy. Uh, and gene therapy is really interesting in that it takes, um, it takes viruses called retroviruses and retroviruses are called retroviruses because they actually work backwards um, compared to normal, normal viruses and the way information normally flows in a cell. Um, retroviruses actually take their own viral RNA and actually turn it into DNA in the nucleus of a cell. So you actually basically retroviruses are rewriting the genetic code of an organism um, in real time. And so if we replace the viral DNA with something helpful, like a copy of a gene that's defective in a specific individual, um, then you could conceivably um, edit their, their genome in real time or not in real time, but you could make fixes to it after um, an organism is already born and developed. Um, that said, it's still a long, long ways out there and it's very controversial as well as all genetic modifications are for humans. Um, but there is, there are in theory ways that that could, that could happen in the future. Um, any good science tips or tricks for cooking? Um, I'm not that great of a cook. I'm, a, I'm very good at washing dishes though. Um, and chemistry is really helpful when it comes for washing, comes to washing dishes. Um, knowing how to get everything to dissolve right without, you know, dissolving the finish off of your cookware, how to clean nonstick stuff without scratching it and um, what you can use to do that. Um, but in general, cooking is very tightly tied to chemistry. Um, so I don't know off the top of my head exactly if there's any one tip or trick Um other than understanding how phase change works is clearly gonna make a difference, right? If you understand how to keep things at a certain temperature, um, it's why you use a hot water or a double boiler to melt chocolate and things like that, because you can be sure that you're not gonna burn the chocolate that way. Um, so there are a lot of things that are done um, that are learned in cooking um, and in culinary schools um, that we can explain why they work with chemistry. But no, I don't really have just one good chemistry trick. Um, this last one I just think is interesting. I didn't actually run the numbers on it, but how hard would you have to slap a chicken in order to produce enough energy to have it end up fully cooked? Um, probably enough that there's not going to be much chicken left. Um, if you talk, we could actually do the math on this. We looked up the total amount. If we just looked at a chicken breast and we looked up the total number of joules that it would take to cook a chicken breast. Um, and actually, this is, I, I don't mind 
doing this, this is kind of a fun hypothetical question. This is um, a type of calculation that we call a, uh, a back of the envelope calculation, meaning I'm not really that interested in getting the right answer. I just want to get it within the right ballpark, say within a factor of 10 or so. Um, and so if we just make the assumption, let's just say that the mass of the chicken breast is of a just a chicken breast, not the whole chicken to simplify things. Um, let's call it, um, but a chicken breast is usually about half a pound maybe before it's cooked. So we'll call it, and then there's roughly two pounds to a, kil to a kilogram. So we'll call it 250 grams of chicken. And if we just assume that this, the specific heat of the chicken is the same as water, joules per gram degree Celsius, and delta T, let's say we're going from room temperature, so 21 Celsius, and we need to cook to get chicken fully cooked, you need to get it to 160 Fahrenheit, which we'll call that uh call that 75 celsius roughly yeah so from 20 to 75 call it 55 degrees celsius we can actually get a q value for this right 55 times 250 times 4.184 and i'm not really all that worried by the fact that these numbers are way off. I'm just wanting it really ballpark. I know I'm not off by a whole factor of 10 here. I know that chicken breast is not two and a half kilograms or 25 grams. So times I get 57.5 kilojoules. So how does that translate into how hard we need to slap that chicken? Well, now that we know that, we can actually go to the, the um, physics definition of kinetic energy and say kinetic energy is equal to one half mass times velocity squared. Well, if we plug this in for the kinetic energy, and we use the mass of your hand, call it, I don't know, one kilogram for your hand. We actually solve for the velocity, which would be the speed that your hand would need to be moving to do this. So 57.5 times 10 to the three joules equals one half times one kilogram velocity squared. So times two, take the square root of that. Get that your hand would need to be moving um, roughly 300 meters per second. Um, 339 meters per second, according to this calculation. Let's just call it 300 meters per second. In other words, your hand would need to be moving roughly the speed of sound in order to do this. So not all that likely hypothetically, but what's kind of cool about this is we could actually get to an answer just using what you guys have already learned in here. Class a little physics. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and if that was interesting to you, I will also use this opportunity to show you one of my favorite authors in the world. Um, is a guy named Randall Monroe. Um, who I think I've talked about before. Um, Randall Monroe was a um, Stanford PhD in robotics and physics uh, who worked for NASA for a few years. Um, yeah, we did the, um, the Purity of the Fields comic. He also has a, um, a blog that he does called What If, he turned it into a book as well, um, where he just answers very, very random physics questions like, what would happen if you could actually throw a baseball at 99% the speed of light? Um, and he actually goes into you know, what the physics would look like to do that and why it would cause a fusion reaction that would end up destroying the entire stadium. It would look like a, fusion, a uh, hydrogen bomb went off. Um, he goes into the math behind that and what, the fall, what it would actually look like um, with 
with funny drawings along the way. Um, yeah, he also answers really weird questions like what would happen if you dropped a T-Rex into the into the Sarlacc from Star Wars? Um, the Sarlacc was that big pit with all the teeth from Return of the Jedi. So he actually looked at what would happen if you dropped a T-Rex into the into the Sarlacc. Very uh, good way to kill kill a few hours of time. I highly recommend his book called What If. <laughs> um, and it does lots. Of, he answers lots of questions like this. <laughs> All right, let's do some practice um, with uh, heating curves. So we're going to deal with something that's not water in this case, but I'm going to give you all the information you need. So we're going to talk about gallium, which is kind of a cool metal. Um, and it's really cool because its melting point is between room temperature and body temperature. Um, so if you actually have pure gallium, you can hold it in your hand and it'll start solid and then you can watch it melt in your hand, which is pretty cool. Um, if gallium melts at 29.7 degrees Celsius, try drawing the heating curve for a piece of gallium that starts at room temperature and warms all the way up to body temperature. All right, so remember a heating curve is temperature on the y-axis and energy on the x-axis. Give that a go and then I'll walk through it in a minute. All right, so for starters, just to, before we're gonna dig into how we actually calculate some of these energies, um, let's draw the heating curves. Remember that I framed it to you as a way, that a heating curve is a really convenient way to keep track of what processes are going to happen as you keep dumping energy in to a system. So for starters, if we start at 21.0 Celsius, and we start dumping energy into the gallium, temperature is going to go up until we hit a phase change, right? If you don't go through a phase change, then your temperature is just always going to go up linearly as you add heat. But as soon as you hit a phase change, that temperature stops going up. So gallium melts at 29.7, and I'm going to stop the screen share. We'll come back to it in a second. When we get to 29.7, here's a shorthand how to not have to write your units every time on a graph. It's just make sure that you label the units on the axis of the graph, and then any number that's on the y-axis can be assumed to be in that same unit. So as we add energy, temperature goes up till we hit the melting point. When we hit the melting point, it levels off. Temperature won't go up when, while it's melting um, because all the extra energy we're adding in is going, is being sort of paid into um, the energy required to go from a solid to a liquid. Then if we continue to add energy, once it's all melted, temperature will start going up again. And if we kept going indefinitely, we would eventually hit a point where the liquid gallium started boiling. And then we would have another flat spot where we're going from liquid gallium to um, gaseous gallium. But in this case, the, the problem statement says we stop at, what did I say, 30, 39? 
36.5. Right, so in the context of these problems, the next step is almost always now figure out how much energy it takes to do that. And again, it's going to come down to, you're going to have to find a different energy for each of these three steps. Because solid gallium is going to have a different specific heat than liquid gallium. And this phase here, this step here, we're going through the phase change, has its own energy costs associated with it. All right, so we're going to break it down into Q1. Q2 and Q3. And once we've broken it up into those chunks, each one of those chunks is not so bad on its own. Q1 is the energy required to heat up gallium from 21 Celsius up to 29.7. So we've got a delta T and we're given a mass and you're given a specific heat. Q3 is the same thing. You've got a temperature change that's given to you. You've got a specific heat that's given to you and you've got a mass. So you plug it into our Q equation. And Q2 is where we're gonna use that energy of phase change. So delta H of fusion in this case. We're just gonna make the units cancel out. We want grams of gallium to cancel out grams of gallium and be left in joules. So if we go ahead and if you haven't already started on this, I'll give you another couple minute head start to work on calculating these numbers, get a number for it, at least get your problem set up, and then I'll walk through the process and we'll get a final answer for it. All right, so I will write the numbers on the board for anything that you don't have written down yet, but I'm gonna stop the screen share and go over this. So again, for Q1 and Q2, or sorry, Q1 and Q3, where we have temperature change, we're using our Q equals mass times specific heat times delta T equation. So it's just a matter of making sure you plug the right numbers in that are all given to you. So for Q1, we're starting as a solid at 21, degrees Celsius, we're going up until we get to 29.7 degrees Celsius, 
So that's going to give us our delta T for the first part. Our specific heat is given to us. We're given both the specific heat for the solid and the liquid. So you need to know which one to use. So you need to think about what, where we're starting. We're starting from the solid and we're warming it up. So we're going to use the specific heat of the solid gallium here. And the mass is not going to change for either of them. So the mass that you're given, the gallium is changing temperature. So that's the mass we care about. Um, Teams is not good for when we wind up. Cells, it won't when we wind up, hang on one second. So if we go ahead and plug our numbers in here, we can get a number for Q1 and for Q3. And then we can wind up actually getting, I'll write those numbers up off to the side here. Q1 is going to be So I get 25 joules per Q1, 25.2 joules, three sig or four sig figs, three sig figs. Actually, our temperature change is only going to be two sig figs, right? Once we do this subtraction, we need to keep the, the uncertainty in the tens place. So our Q1 is only going to have two sig figs now, so 25 joules. Q3 is going to have the same problem here. Our delta T is only going to be two sig figs. So we're going to wind up with two sig figs as well for there. I get 21 joules for Q3. And so the last step then that we don't have yet is we need the Q for this phase change, right? And so this is where we use, you need to be given, just like with the specific heat or the um, Q problems, you need to be given a specific heat, right? Or you at least need to be given three or four parts of the equation. You need to know what the Delta H is for this specific process in order to do this, but it, it's given in this case. So for Q2, we've got 7.805 grams of the gallium. And for every, for every one gram of gallium that melts, it's going to absorb 80.2 joules. And we plug that in, our grams cancel grams. Get 626 joules. We get to keep three sig figs here because we don't have a delta T term, right? All we have is four sig figs on the mass, three sig figs on the delta H. So that's what we're going to keep. It's three sig figs. All right, so our total, our total energy absorbed for this entire process is going to be the sum of Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. It takes a different amount of energy for each of these steps. So the total energy is just adding them up. So Q total, 7647673672. Assuming I can add my head correctly, which is a big assumption some days, but I think that that's right. <laughs> 
right? So, and we're, this is, I'm gonna keep harping on this as well. When we get these big picture problems, like what's the total of anything, the more you can break it up into individual chunks, the easier it's gonna seem because each one of those Q values was pretty straightforward to find now that you've seen the, um, how to do the uh, phase change ones, especially, right? There's nothing tricky about any of those individual pieces, but writing out the heating curve and knowing what to do to get what type of calculation each of those pieces was is really the trickiest part here. Um, you know, mathematicians and physicists like to look down on chemistry as being too simple, um, overly simplistic sometimes, but it's a little bit like, um, like, you know, hiring a mechanic to fix your car and all he does is walk over to the engine and he hits it one time and he charges you a hundred dollars. You're not paying him a hundred dollars to hit the engine. You're paying him $99 to know where to hit it and $1 to hit it with the, with the hammer. 99% of what we need to do in chemistry is knowing how to set up the problem. The math is the easy part. So that's what we're gonna keep working on. And the more you can see those parallels and the more you can figure out how to set things up as conversions, the easier it's gonna seem. And Katie, the, let me go back to the screen share here to answer your question. Um, it is given in the, in the equation, if you look down at the bottom right, it says delta H of fusion. So that's specifically, is talking about the energy of, of either going from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a solid. Um, if it was, if we were looking at evaporation, then you'd have a delta H of vaporization. Um, or if we we're looking at sublimation, you would have a delta H of sublimation, which would be going directly from a gas to a um, gas to a solid, or vice versa. All right, these don't seem so scary now. Hopefully, right? These aren't particularly tricky um, once you know what you're doing. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about atomic theory, and we're going to do the rest of this lecture is going to be fairly concept heavy and not very math heavy. Um, so it'll be some vocab, mm -hmm. some big concepts, um, some kind of cool concepts if we get to the quantum stuff and get to you know it's always fun to get to talk about quantum since that's that's uh, you know a magic word that gets thrown around in TV shows as uh, makes everything make sense if you just throw quantum in front of it. Um, all of a sudden it's sci-fi. Um, but we'll actually talk about what that means um, in this class or in next class, depending. All right. So for those of you who are in lab on Monday, some of these are going to be duplicate slides. Um, so you'll be seeing them again. Quantum leap, exactly. <laughs> um, so this goes back to ancient Greek times, and it was a, it started as a thought experiment. It was not even a real scientific experiment because they didn't have a way to test it. It's a, nothing is science until you have a way to test it, whether your hypothesis is true. Um, in ancient Greece, they didn't understand the scientific method. Um, it wasn't, scientific method was, was first like formalized and put forth in writing during the, uh, I want to say it's around 1,900 to 1,080. Um, in, uh, in the Persian em empire. Um, so in the ancient Greeks, they didn't really understand it. Um, they just said, well, if we take a piece of copper wire and we start dividing it in half and we just keep dividing those halves in half again, we get smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and uh, basically they narrowed it down using logic to say, well, there, there's only two options. Either you could keep dividing that copper infinitely there's no point where you would get to a spot where that copper is too small to cut in half again. Or you get to a point where you can't cut the copper in half anymore. Right. And so Democritus was the one who said, who held this opinion. 
there's got to be some point where we can't cut it in half anymore. Um, again, they couldn't test this, so they didn't really know. And Aristotle was really good at math in other areas and really well known in philosophy and math in ancient Greece. And so Aristotle's view was actually the, um, the prevailing view up until about the 1600s. Um, that matter can be infinitely small, and it's made by varying varying amounts of the four primal elements, as they're known in, in Greece. Um, and this is why we actually use the term elements on the periodic table of the elements, is because of this idea that everything that exists is made up just by mixing various pieces of, um, of the elements. And so we started, you know, in the alchemy, alchemy times in the you know the dark ages in Europe they started adding new elements to this list well gold is not fire or water or um or earth or wind it's its own element and they started going through all the alchemy you know sort of I don't know if you could call it logic um but uh started using alchemy terms um following along with what Aristotle had put forth but it wasn't until the 1600s that Democritus's ideas got brought back um by some of the early physicists and chemists. Um, and it was specifically these three, they were probably physicists more than anything at that point. Lavoisier, Proust, and Dalton, a bunch of, of uh, old white European dudes um, who basically looked at three laws that they, as, as alchemy was starting to be become out of favor in Europe, they started trying to find less magic-based and more science-based thinking. Um, and so they, they came up with these three laws just by observing what happens. They had a set of things that happened that they called chemical reactions, and they just sort of observed that um, hey, if you start with a certain amount of mass, are you, are you okay with the, after a chemical the reaction, you always for, get you that know? same yeah. amount of mass back. And so if if your schooling was somewhat like mine in elementary school, I think probably about what fifth or sixth grade, you first see this idea come up. Um, but at the time, that was something that people didn't really understand. That was actually revolutionary at the time. Um, and then Proust actually figured out that you always wound up, they, they had figured out a way that you could take things like water, or various chemical compounds, and break them up into individual elements. Um, and he, what Proust found is that you always got the same ratio of oxygen, mass of oxygen to mass of hydrogen if you were breaking down water. It was always in a ratio of about 16 grams of oxygen for every two grams of hydrogen. And so, and it didn't matter where the water came from, didn't matter how much water you had, it always gave you the same ratio. Then the last piece of the puzzle, and the reason Dalton gets his name on the atomic theory, is because he's the one who realized that if you have multiple reactions happening, um, or if you have multiple compounds that are made out of the same two elements, they're always gonna combine in a whole number ratio. Meaning if you have water that always turns into two grams of hydrogen for every 16 grams of oxygen, well, if you took hydrogen peroxide, which they had at the time, they didn't know what it was really, but they knew that if you took hydrogen peroxide, it was two grams of hydrogen for every 32 grams of oxygen. And Dalton looked at that and said, well, 32 is exactly twice 16. Every time he did this, if you looked at these various compounds that were made out of the, out of, right. um, the same two elements, you always got a whole number ratio of these different elements. Um, and so that was kind of interesting, but really what was what Dalton's genius was really in realizing what that meant is that you had a discrete number of else. objects. The reason that you got a certain ratio and that ratio was always a whole number ratio 
was because we were dealing with discrete objects that you could not have pieces of. You can't have a piece of an atom. So Dalton um, brought back uh, Democritus's theory and he formalized it more. And so atom the first atomic theory um, was had this format of four postulates to it, four pieces. Uh, every element is made up of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. All atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from other elements. So in, in other words, every oxygen atom is the same as every other oxygen atom. And other elements um, are different than oxygen and will never have the same properties as oxygen. We do. The third piece is that atoms combined in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. And that's the piece that Dalton put together that allowed this all to work was mm -hmm. that and and make sense as far as as logical proof. Thank you. And then fourth, atoms cannot change from one element to another. They can only change how they're bound to other atoms. Right. And so this was really the piece that kind of put the, the nail in the coffin for alchemy. Right, because alchemy was based around the idea that if you started from something cheap, what they call a base metal like lead or tin, you could turn it into gold um, if you had the right process. Right, um, and so four was basically in there to say, hey, we're talking about something totally different than alchemy at this point. Alchemy is out the window; that doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and all of these have been revised over the years. None of these still hold up exactly as they are, but none of them have been thrown out either. None of them have been disproven. Um, there, We just basically have to add extra little caveats. For instance, this word indestructible. Well, that's not really accurate because atoms, if you put them in high enough energy situations, you can get atoms to either fuse into other atoms or into break up into pieces. And same for number four. With enough energy, you can get one element to switch into to turn into another element. It's so four, I guess, is the one that has been closest to being just plain out thrown thrown out the window. But under normal circumstances, at the the energy levels we're talking about on the surface of the Earth, um, number four still holds up. It's not until you get to really really high energy situations that um, number four is basically th thrown out and we can explain why that is with more um physics if you take enough physics All right so this is great this is basically the founding principles of chemistry um but it wasn't very long after that that basically we started having to see that things are problematic with this for instance, um, a guy named Thompson, I believe it was Thompson. Now I'm blanking on it, um, on who it was. Um, he figured out that if you take if you take a glass tube that he called it a cathode ray tube, and you seal it, you remove all the air from it, so it's basically a vacuum. Vacuum, and you put a voltage from one end to the other. If that voltage is big enough you actually get tiny little particles that fly from one end of the tube to the other. Um, and what he noticed was that these, these rays, he called them cathode rays, because they came from the cathode and moved towards the anode. Um, he knows that these cathode rays traveled in straight lines and that they had a negative charge. And this is the one that was really problematic or that was really interesting is he also knows that could measure the mass of them and they were 2000 times smaller than hydrogen. And hydrogen was already known to be the smallest element. And he also knows that they're identical no matter what material he used, no matter what you put on either end of the cathode and the anode, um, you wound up with the same particles flying through, same cathode rays, no matter what. So. If hydrogen atoms are the smallest atoms and nothing is smaller than an atom, this third point becomes a really kind of a sticking point, right? 
because we just finished putting out the atomic theory that said, well, L atoms are the smallest thing in existence and hydrogen is the smallest atom. So if they're 2000 times smaller by mass than hydrogen, that means that that part of the atomic theory has kind of has to go out the window. Um, or at the very least, we have to add some caveats there. Specifically, the main conclusion made here is that atoms are made up of even smaller pieces. You have to have these other pieces in order to explain why you've got something that's 2,000 times smaller than hydrogen and why these, these cathode rays are the same no matter what material you're using. So it's the same fundamental particles that we're mixing together in different ways to make the different elements. So, and this is sort of how the, the logic went at that point. At, we know atoms are neutral. We knew we made up, we found these smaller pieces called electrons. Electrons is the better term for a cathode ray. Cathode rays don't really exist. It's really what he was measuring was, was electrons. Um, if we know electrons are negative, but, the, but atoms are neutral, what else do we know about atoms? There has to be something positive. Good, Chase. Because the, we need the positives and the negatives to cancel out to get a neutral atom. Um, and so this came, this actually is the, um, led to our, the first model that started looking at subatomic particles. Um, which is called the plum pudding model. Um, and the plum pudding was is a British term. Um, I don't know if you ask me the British don't don't get desserts very much because they put plums in this like bready stuff and they call it a dessert. Um, it's not really cake, but if you look up pictures of plum pudding, it doesn't look particularly appetizing to me anyway. Um, it's like a fruit cake, basically. Yeah, that's a good picture. So their idea at this point is that basically atoms looked like plum pudding, that you had this sort of cakey mass that held the electrons and the electrons were like the plums. The electrons were negative and they just sort of sat in the plum pudding um, and that plum pudding was positively charged. So cool, that's interesting. It kind of bits, um, ex except we don't, we need a way to actually show that, right? So um, I, so I think that this actually goes in a direct line from people working in the same lab. Dalton's um, protege, his name was Thompson, discovered electrons. And then Thompson's student, um, whose name was Rutherford, was actually trying to prove the plum pudding model correct when he came up with a, his big contribution. Um, and his big contribution was basically like, well, I have, I know I can make a uh, radioactive source that makes these alpha particles. And these alpha particles are positively charged. They're super high energy and they're really fast. So if I take gold and I pound it flat enough, I'm going to fire these alpha particles at it. And what should happen if the plum pudding model is right is that these, these positively charged alpha particles should slow down when they hit the, the gold foil. Um, because they're running into something that's positively charged. So that should push back against them and slow them down. So basically, this is what Rutherford was expecting, is that the, all of the um, alpha particles would go right through the plum pudding model and just be moving slower at the other side. What he actually saw was that almost all of those alpha particles went right through the gold foil and they hit the other side at the same energy that they started with. So I'm gonna go back to this, this figure. Almost all of the alpha particles went straight through, had the same energy both sides, but it, some of them, a small amount of them, bounced off at really surprising angles. And so that, that essentially was, was the end of the plum pudding model at this point. 
because the plum pudding model said, well, there's positives and negatives and it fits some of the data, but it didn't account for that. And so Rutherford was the one who came up with, with the nuclear atomic theory. And the nuclear atomic theory was that all of the atom's mass, or at least most of it, is in one tiny little spot right in the middle that we call the nucleus. Um, the positive charge is also in the nucleus, which explains why that we didn't we only saw electrons flying around when we did those cathode ray tubes. So the electrons are surrounding the nucleus. The nucleus has all, all the positive charge and it has all the mass. And so now all of a sudden this, one of the reasons I really like teaching this experiment in particular is because this is a good example of how science is supposed to work, right? Science is supposed to work by you design an experiment to see if one of your theories is, is correct or if your hypothesis is correct. And if it's wrong, you don't go back and just throw out the data. If it's wrong, you try and figure out what's wrong with your hypothesis, because whatever happens in the lab has to be what the real world is, right? That's, it is the real world. You're measuring the real world. So Rutherford went into this expecting that he was going to be proving his, his mentor's theory correct. But instead he got something that totally turned everything on its head. And he had to come up with totally new hypothesis that threw out the plum pudding model entirely. So that's not how science always does work. Occasionally people have their own pet hypotheses. And when, when data doesn't agree with their hypothesis, they throw out the data instead of the hypothesis. That's backwards. This is the way science is supposed to be and the way, the way that the peer review process works in general is that you have to convince every other scientist that your hypothesis is right using the data. And if your data doesn't match, then the hypothesis is wrong, or at least needs to be changed. All right. So we're going to pause there and take our 10 minute break. Let's come back at 2.30. And we will continue to go through and uh, add some stuff to this. <laughs>
All right, folks, let's start coming back here. All right, so to recap, we now have a couple good ways of describing how these atoms work. Or at least not how they work, but but what they're made of anyway, what their structure is. So refer to this as, as the as atomic structure, um, which sounds like, you know, at least for those of us who were born during the Cold War, it sounds like something you should be scared of. Atomic structure might be a good band name for a, for a new wave group from the 80s. Um, you know, you've got atomic structure opening for Joy Division. Sounds like a good like it could work. Um, but atomic structure just means what are the atoms shaped like and what are they made out of? Right, so the, the shape is generally, this nuclear theory is, is this um, way we usually describe them. And basically we treat all of the mass and all of the positive charge, like it's grouped in the middle into the, that we call the nucleus. Um, and then the electrons exist in, uh, they, they are surrounding the nucleus. And that's why the electrons are the pieces that fly off. When we had these CRT, the cathode ray tubes, the electrons are the pieces that fly off of the atoms. The, the nucleus is basically stuck being the nucleus. It doesn't change, at least not easily. But the number, but the electrons can be knocked off of the atom relatively easily because they're not stuck in the nucleus. They're surrounding the nucleus. Right. And so the positive charge that's that is um, that the nucleus is made up of uh, is made up of a bunch of, of discrete objects and discrete, I mean, using discrete in the math sense, the word mean meaning um, it has to be a counting number. So there's no tenths of a proton. A discrete number means it's only integers. <clears throat> and so this, this nuclear theory said that you had to have a discrete number of protons in the nucleus, and that's also where all the mass was. Uh, so we're going to define a couple of terms here. And actually, make sure I get the order of this part right. Um, the, the way we structure elements on the periodic table now is we have a couple of things that are actually wind up all being identical or not identical, but they're different ways of saying the same thing. The atomic symbol, which is always two letters, the one or two letters, the first of which is capitalized, um, is just, is just an abbreviation usually of the element name. But both of those are actually defined by the atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus, right? And so, and it's always a whole number. And those are the numbers that go up nice and even on the periodic table, right? Hydrogen is one, helium is two. As you start going through the periodic table, the atomic number is what actually defines the individual elements, right? So an element is defined by the number of protons it has. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. Um, so technically you don't need the atomic symbol or the element name to discuss things. It's just easier to talk about argon than it is to talk about atomic number 18. So we have names for the elements just for ease of describing them and for historical reasons. Um, so the, the downside to think about it the way we've talked about it so far is that this middle thing, this mass number doesn't really match up necessarily with the atomic number. And, and in fact, the slide I was looking for that I don't, don't know exactly where it went. That's OCHEM. Um, 
lays out the logic for a third type of subatomic particle. Um, this one. So they knew, for instance, hydrogen and helium were two of the most well-known elements at this point. They knew that hydrogen was the smallest element because it had one proton. If you had any fewer protons, it wouldn't be an element at all because a proton is what makes number of protons is what makes the element, right? And they knew helium had two protons, but helium was not twice as heavy as hydrogen. It was four times as heavy as hydrogen. And so what they came up with was this idea that there was other another particle that didn't have a charge that was not a proton or a new or an electron, but it did have mass. Right. So then so neutrons have mass but no charge. Electrons have charge but no mass. Protons have both. I'll say that again in a second. Um, but this also allows us to look at the mass number and the atomic number and figure out how many neutrons we have. If we know, if we want to know how many protons are in a specific atom, um, we just need to know what kind of atom it is. If it's an argon atom, then we know that the, by definition, the atomic number is 18. So that tells us that it's 100% has to have 18 protons. And the abbreviation for a proton is a lowercase p with a positive charge, with a um, positive superscript after it. And so the atomic number is what tells us that. And from there, we can figure out how many electrons and neutrons we have. Because if it's an a neutral atom, if the atom has a neutral charge and it has 18 protons, each proton with a positive charge, if it's neutral, we have to also have 18 electrons. And the symbol for an electron is a lowercase e with a negative sign um, as a superscript. And last but not least, the neutrons have nothing to do with charge. That's where the neutron, the name neutron comes from, is neutral. So neutrons have no charge, but they do have a mass. We basically treat protons and neutrons each like they have a mass of one. And we'll talk of one AMU. Um, and we'll talk about how we can use that. That's a kind of a strange mass unit. We'll talk about how to use that um, later. Um, but basically, if you add up the number of protons plus neutrons, you should get the mass number. The mass number is basically just add up all the pieces that have mass. Ignore electrons because they weigh so little, we can basically say they don't weigh anything. So if it's argon with this mass number, 39.944, let's call that 40. So if we have a mass number of 40 and 18 protons, the number of neutrons is just the difference between the mass number and the protons. So that in this case, that would be 22 neutrons. And a neutron is a lowercase n. Apparently, n's are the hardest for me to draw today with my mouse. Um, is a lowercase n. And to be very specific about it, we put a zero for the charge. The charge is always what's written in the top right is a superscript. So a pro lowercase p with a positive charge is a proton. Lowercase e with a negative charge is an electron. A lowercase n with no charge is a neutron. Or you could just write out the word neutron. Right, so the prime primary skill that you that we're getting from this lecture 
is we're laying the groundwork explaining why these things, why we have evidence that these subatomic particles exist, despite the fact we can't see them under a microscope. Um, and it's also going to allow us to describe every type of matter that there is in terms of only three pieces. It's all protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so here are key some, some more key vocab. If we vary the three subatomic particles in a specific atom, that gives us every type of matter. Well, every type of matter that we see on Earth on a regular basis. Um, the elements are defined by the number of protons. If you change the number of protons, you get a different element. Once you know what the number of protons is, once you know what the uh, atomic number is, changing the number of electrons is going to change the charge on that atom. And an atom that has a charge actually has a specific name that we call an ion. An ion is just a um, it's just an atom or a molecule with a charge. And we will absolutely see. I guess I shouldn't shouldn't speak too too uh, cavalierly. It's very very likely that we will continue adding to the periodic table. Um, the reason that nuclei are held together at all is actually is because there is some attractive force between neutrons and protons. When you get them so close enough that um, that the positive charges can't push them apart. Once you stick them together as a nucleus, um, there are actually two other forces. They call the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force. That's actually what holds together atoms um, as a nucleus. And if you look at how strong those forces are, um, physicists can predict about where we should see stable elements forming. So if I go to my... I want to no. I go to my periodic table. Um, just recently they added element one eighteen. The research to discover one eighteen one I think it's one eighteen one thirteen and one fifteen. It was four of them the same year. It was 113, 115, 17, and 18. We're all added to the periodic table in the same year, um, which was only a, a year, couple of years ago. Um, and the research was done about five years before that. But you can see that that's only getting up to 118 protons in a nucleus. In theory, those strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force should actually cancel each other out and you should get stable nuclei again once you get up into the 120 to 125 range. Um, they call it the island of stability. Um, and so it's basically the island of stability is a way we have of predicting exactly what elements, what isotopes are going to be stable. Um, and so in this case, this is just from Wikipedia, Z is the number of protons. Um, and N is the number of neutrons. And you can see that they follow a pretty predictable pattern where the black are the ones, the black dots are the ones that are really stable. Um, this little area up here, though, once you get above 110, the 118 is right in here, you sh there should be some more stable elements out there um, that we just have not been able to make them yet. Um, in particular, let's see, there's a number of neutrons, number of protons, this little yellow area in the top. When you get up, up there, you start to see some, some stability. Um, and what that turns into is basically there should be some relatively stable but hard to make elements that have some really interesting properties. They should be super dense. They should be really, really good conductors. And they should be stable enough that they can last for a fairly long time. Um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens and if those wind up being elements that we can produce on a large scale or a large enough scale that we could use them for 
um, certain uh, electrical applications. Um, and the way they do that is like I mentioned before, you literally just throw these atoms at each other hard enough that their nuclei stick together. If you do that and you get the right combination of neutrons and protons and the right speed, they stick together and you get a new element. Um, so the last piece of the puzzle for those are these uh, neutrons. So changing protons gives you different elements. Changing ion or changing number of electrons gives you an ion. If you change, if you have a a not specific number of neutrons plus protons in the nucleus, then you wind up with the. Did I freeze or is that just on my Zoom? Okay, good. Um, we wind up defining specific isotopes by looking at um, the total number of protons plus neutrons in a nucleus. Right? And so an isotope is just anytime we're being specific about this particular atom has this many protons and this many neutrons, then we're defining a specific isotope. An isotope is not just something that shows up when we start talking about nuclear chemistry. When we start talking about nuclear chemistry, we wind up with um, the specific isotope mattering a lot. For instance, uranium-235 is for power plants, but uranium-238 is for bombs. I think I have those backwards. Um, and those, the difference between those two isotopes may, winds up making a big difference, but an isotope really is just anytime we're being specific about the number of neutrons. So for instance, if we wanted to talk about the um, isotopes of carbon, um, you can have carbon. Carbon is always going to have six protons in the nucleus. But its total mass is either going to be 12, 13, or 14. If those are the most common ones anyway. And so if you have if you have six protons and six neutrons in the same nucleus, that is what we call carbon. 12. The 12 is just referring to the fact we add six protons plus six neutrons. There's also a, another, a second stable isotope of carbon that's carbon 13. Well, it's still carbon, so it's still going to have six protons, but it actually has seven neutrons. And we call that carbon. 13, just because adding 6 plus 7 gives us 13, right? So this number, the, the isotope number or the mass number is always just the sum of the pieces in the nucleus. Then the last one that's not as stable, it's one that we use to, um, to date um, how, old, how long ago living organisms died, uh, is carbon-14. Carbon-14 is not stable. It's stable enough that, you, that it will break down. Um, you'll have it break up into smaller pieces over the course of about 6,000 years. Um, 6,000 years after you stop breathing, your body will have half of the carbon-14 that it started with. Um, so that's the way, carb and we'll talk about that math more when we get to, if you're taking the gen chem series, we'll do, spend a lot of time with carbon dating and, and other radioactive isotopes. Um, but essentially, you, you still have six protons, it's still carbon, but it actually has eight neutrons. And it's formed actually by carbon dioxide in the upper atmosphere getting bombarded by solar radiation. Um, and then what happens though is when there, so there's a small amount of carbon 14 that's always in our atmosphere. And what's happening when living things live is every living thing that is on earth is either um, based around photosynthesis where it's taking CO2 from the atmosphere and turning it into sugar, or it's something that eats. Um, organisms that photosynthesize. 
So basically everything that lives on earth is constantly taking in low levels of carbon 14. And so we can date when that object or when that organism stopped eating or stopped, basically died by looking at how much carbon 14 is left. Um, so, and that's, that's why there's limitations to how carbon-14 dating works. Carbon-14 dating only works to date things that were once living because you're looking at specifically at an element, at a isotope um, that is brought into those organisms by way of eating or photosynthesizing. Interesting side note, at least it's interesting to me which means you guys get to hear about it too. <clears throat> so anytime we have a specific isotope, that just means we're talking about all of the total particles in the nucleus. Um, and the... That was the wrong one. Um, this page. Um, the, uh, the term we use to describe particles in the nucleus. Um, you might see this term show up um, called the nucleons. A nucleon is just any particle that's in the nucleus. So a proton or a neutron. Um, however, scientists don't like using or in their definitions. Um, so rather than then uh, say, just say isotopes are defined by protons plus neutrons or protons or neutrons. Um, they say nucleons. So this is the basis of this week's Labster simulation has you looking at um, what happens to the nucleus as we add things and you can kind of play around with it and see, but essentially when you, um, if you change um, number of protons, you're going to move left or right on the periodic table. If you take carbon 14 and it, um, carbon 14 will naturally decay into nitrogen 14. You, the nuclear process that where carbon-14 breaks down turns one of those neutrons into a proton. Um, but basically, by changing, by adding a proton, we're moving from atomic number of six to atomic number of seven. If you change the number of electrons, you're changing the overall charge. If you change the number of neutrons, you're changing the isotope. Right? So this slide that I just had up is, is the bullet point version of what, what you need at this point for the homework and for the Labster simulation. There's a lot more flavor to it and there's a lot more um, that we can do with this. I can, this also means that the periodic table is really useful for doing things like writing conversions because you can write a conversion that says one oxygen atom equals eight protons, for instance because oxygen is the atomic number of eight, right? So this is getting into being able to write conversions that are um, not just converting units, just by, by virtue of being able to say these two things are true at the same time. One oxygen atom equals eight protons. And so if you, hopefully you have a periodic table if you do not, you might be switching back and forth between windows to do um, some of these assignments. It'd be a good idea to get a printed version if you can. Uh, if anybody doesn't have access to a printer and doesn't have a periodic table, I can always print some copies off out and uh, leave them at the um, uh, library on campus. If you just let me know, um, I can make, I can print things for you guys to some extent if you're local. Um, but if we have a periodic table, we can fill in this entire chart where if we know the symbol, including the mass and the chart, the mass number and the charge, which is written in the top right. And if nothing's written there, you can assume the charge is zero. 
um, then we can write, fill in number of protons, neutrons, electrons, and what the isotope name is. So I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to try and fill some of these in, and then I will fill them in as well. And Alan, I just saw your question. Yes, you can have an ion isotope. Everything is an isotope. It's just a lot of times we don't specify because we're just saying whatever the natural mix of isotopes is on Earth. Um, so a lot of times we won't specify the isotope, but you can absolutely have a specific isotope that has a charge, as in the bottom left there. All right, let's start filling some of these in. So if you know the atomic symbol, then if, as long as you have a periodic table, you also know the atomic number. Right, the fact that this first line is in capital N tells us it's nitrogen. And nitrogen is number seven on the periodic table. So by definition, but because it's nitrogen, we know that the atomic number is seven. And if we know the atomic number is seven, we also know the number of protons. It's always just going to be the same. The number of neutrons we're going to get by taking this mass number that's given. So it's if we're talking about a specific isotope, it's always going to be a superscript to the left of the symbol. So if the total mass is 14, our number of protons, our number of neutrons, is going to be 14 minus the seven protons. So in other words, seven neutrons. For the smaller elements, a lot of times the most stable isotope has the same number of protons and neutrons. But after you get past like about the second or third row on the periodic table, it winds up being more of a, a one for every one proton, you get 1.6 neutrons, except you can't have decimals. So it's kind of an approximate relationship. Um, but you, so you can't always just assume protons and neutrons are going to be the same. What you can do, though, is if you don't have a charge, then you can always assume that protons and electrons are the same. Because remember, electrons have a charge, but no mass. Uh, and this is a good time to talk about these charges. Um, a lot of times in chemistry, we're, we're not really picky about whether you write negative 1 or 1 minus. For a charge because sometimes if you if you switch the order of the negative symbol and the one it'll make it hard to see the negative symbol at all um you can wind up with they call those kerning issues typographical issues where your negative sign winds up running into your letter um for instance down here whoa um for the bromine if i put then if i put negative one if I, 
you can see how that negative symbol, if you're looking at really small type, that negative symbol would look like it was part of the R potentially, right? Or if I picked a different font. So we're not really picky about one minus or minus one. They mean the same thing. They both are referring to the charge and they're both just as, as accurate of a way to write it, right? See how that's a little bit easier to see that that's separate symbols. Um, keep doing that. And so I, um, you don't need to write the, the one for an electron either. That means an electron. Sometimes it's helpful to make sure that people see the negative sign to put a one next to it. And it's, it's implied if it's not written. And so our isotope name for this one would just be nitrogen 14. And I'm trying to make, make a point here. We do not capitalize elements or compound names. They're not proper nouns. Um, so when I, if we're filling in this table, Windows keeps trying to autocorrect it for me, but you do not need to capitalize them. If you're writing a sentence that involves the name of an element, you don't capitalize the name of the element. Um, which is really weird because some elements are named after people. So you would capitalize the person's name, like Einsteinium. You capitalize Einstein, but you don't capitalize Einsteinium because one's a person and one's an object. Um, if we wanted to fill in the second row here, zinc 68 atom. Well, first we need to know where zinc is on the periodic table. I think it's number 30. It's right around 30 if it's not 30. Yeah, there it is. So zinc has the atomic number of 30. So the fact that it is zinc tells us it, the atomic number is 30, which also tells us we have 30 protons. And the fact that it says atom and not ion tells us that the charge has to be neutral. So that means by, defini by definition, it also has to have 30 electrons. We wanted to fill in a number of neutrons. The mass number is 68. Right there. So the neutrons is going to be the mass number minus the protons. So in this case, 38. And last but not least, if we wanted to write the symbol, the symbol for zinc is Zn. And if we want to specify a specific isotope, we put a 68 as a superscript to the left of the symbol. And again, just like with the units, where I'm going to be very, I'm going to be even more picky about capitalizing on atomic symbols than on um, units, because mixing up whether you capitalize them or not is a very big deal. For instance, CS could be copper sulfide or it could be cesium, depending on how you capitalize it. So it means very different things, potentially, if you capitalize both letters. And so even for those of you who um, who cap write in all caps, for instance, or if you write your capital letters and your capital letters just like look like big lowercase letters, when you're writing atomic symbols, you may have to change your handwriting. Um, so for mine in particular, my handwriting when I was in high school was really atrocious. If you think it's bad now, you should have seen, seen it when, uh, when I wasn't teaching. Um, and so my, my chemistry teacher made a point of saying, you can't do that because that is unclear whether that's an L or an I. 
So to be explicit, I got into the habit of all of my cursive, over, all of my lowercase L's I wrote as cursive L's, just for the sake of making it very clear that's an L and then that's an I, right? So you, you need to have a very, very distinct difference between your capitals and your lowercase. Um, you see what's another good, another good example, chlorine. So there's a chlorine atom or that's copper iodide, right? So just be very cautious with the atomic symbols. Make sure that it's always capital first letter, lowercase second letter. Carbon dioxide is another good one. There's not really a good way to differentiate between capital O's and lowercase O's other than just making the size difference really obvious. There's carbon dioxide. That's a cobalt atom of some sort. All right, so just be careful with those, with your capitalization. Um, and the, the nature of chemists trying to be very, very efficient with their characters, with their letters, means we also have to be very, very pedantic about making sure that we do everything just so when you write them, or you're going to communicate the wrong idea to somebody else. All right, if we know the atomic number and neutrons and electrons, we can work backwards to get the name. So atomic number of 16 is, go to number 16 on the periodic table, which is sulfur. So we know it's going to be a sulfur atom. Um, and we know it has to be an atom that there's going to be no charge to it because we have the same number of electrons as your atomic number because atomic number tells us the number of protons, right? And if we have 16 protons and 18 neutrons, that specifically tells us what isotope we have. It's that's going to be sulfur. 34. 16 plus 18 is 34. Yeah. And then the symbol for this, again, would just be capital S is sulfur. So, and we have a mass number of 34. So it's going to be going to look like that. And again, for all of these, if no charge is shown, you can assume that the charge is zero, that the, it's a neutral atom. All right, these, these last two that are ions, the sodium 23 ion, we need to be careful with this. The fact that it's sodium tells us that it has an atomic number of 11. We check on the periodic table. Sodium is number 11. So atomic number 11 means 11 protons. The fact that it's sodium 23 and it has 11 protons tells us that we must have 12 neutrons. Right, because protons plus neutrons has to add up to 23. And last, if we know it's got 10 electrons, and we know it's got 11 protons, 11 pluses and 10 minuses means you've got one extra plus one. So that tells us our overall charge has to be 
plus one because we have one extra proton and the protons are positive. You can also think of protons as pushing pushing up on, on um, your keyboard and electrons pushing down. If you have 11 ups and only 10 downs, your net result is you have one extra up, one extra plus. All right, so our symbol here, the atomic symbol for sodium is Na. The mass number is 23 for this isotope. And the charge is plus one or just plus. And last but not least is bromine. Bromine's atomic number 35. So that tells us we can fill in, well, first off, we can fill in the name here. It's going to be bromine 78 ion. Atomic number 35, which means 35 protons. 78 minus 35, it's gonna be 35 and eight, 43. I think, yeah. And the number of electrons, if we have a negative one charge, that means we have one extra electron because the electrons are negative charge. So an overall negative one charge means we have one more electron than proton. So that tells us it's gotta be 36 electrons. Right, so this is another one of those skills that might be review. Um, it might not be review for you. You want to be able to fill in a chart like this in your sleep, because this is going to be 10% of the final exam is going to be doing this. And it's really, really easy once you get, get the rules down. And my strategy as a student um, when taking tests was always to make sure that I got 100% of the easy points, right? I might spend more time studying the hard stuff, but I, you have to study the easy stuff enough that you don't screw it up on the test, right? Don't leave the easy money on the table. Make sure that you get your easy points. And this should be in that category by the end of the week, right? A little bit of practice, a little bit of remembering, protons are positive, electrons are negative and you should be good to go. That's what this week's lab and homework is all about, is getting this down back. Any questions on this chart so far? Did I didn't do anything that was confusing, that was inconsistent? All right, we have a few minutes left. Um, so I'm not gonna add any super tricky new concepts in there. Um, I'm gonna go through more of those those uh, differentiations and, and um, vocabulary terms that are not all that useful to, to teach you guys, but you need to see them so that in other classes, you will know what, what certain terms mean. Um, and so this is a little bit better of definitions than it comes to chemical versus physical. That's the one that really bothers me because physical processes are chemical and vice versa. Um, these are actually a little bit more concrete terms as far as we can be very, very distinct and objective about it. Um, and so that, that specific definition is a pure substance versus a mixture. Um, a pure substance is any time the atoms are always combined the same way, meaning you have the same types of bonds, you have all the atoms are, are spatially arranged in the same way, then you're gonna get a pure substance. Um, and the, the simplest form of a pure substance is just having a pure element. So anytime we have a whole bunch of atoms where every atom has the same number of protons in it, that's a pure element. 
Um, and so, for instance, if we have helium as a gas, every helium atom has the same number of protons and has more or less the same properties. Um, and so we consider that a pure substance that's made of a single element. So we call that an elemental um, substance or just an element. Copper metal, aluminum metal, um, anytime you have a metal that's also on the periodic table, it's a pure substance as well. So gold, silver, mercury, gallium, zinc, those are all pure elemental substances. Oxygen gas is a pure elemental substance. Um, it's a sort of, it's a, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, if you have a pure substance that's made up of more than one element, then it's, it's called a compound, right? So compound by definition is more than one element, but they're always connected in the same ratio, right? That's, that's what that law of multiple proportions um, that uh, Dalton discovered was showing is that if you have a pure substance that's made of more than one element, they all have always have to be connected the same way and in the same ratio. Otherwise, you actually have two different substances. So for instance, water, not tap water, not water that you would actually drink, but pure deionized water, distilled water, is going to be a pure compound. Every oxygen is attached to two hydrogens within sig figs, almost every oxygen. Every oxygen is identical. And for the most, it, it, gets, it gets tricky because water never exists as a pure substance. But in theory, every oxygen in pure water should be attached to two hydrogens and therefore it, every at molecule is identical to every other molecule. Um, table salt's another good example. Table salt is sodium chloride, which is a sodium with a plus charge and a chlorine with a negative charge. They're always combined in the same ratio. You always have the exact same number of chlorides as sodiums within sig figs. And hydrogen peroxide is another example. It's also just hydrogen and oxygen, but combined in a one-to-one -one ratio, or rather a two-to-two -two ratio. For every two hydrogens, you get two oxygens instead of water. So this is why hydrogen peroxide and water are two different compounds, even though they're both made up of high, just hydrogen and oxygen, but they're combined in a different ratio and in a different way. Uh, and realistically, the hydrogen peroxide that you get in, in the brown bottle at the grocery store um, is not actually pure hydrogen peroxide. It's hydrogen peroxide mixed with water. So this figure is a little bit misleading, but if it was pure hydrogen peroxide, every ad or every molecule would look like this, two oxygens and two hydrogens. Um, if you have a mixture, that just means that it's not a pure substance. A mixture is anytime you've got more than one element mixed together or more than one compound mixed together where not every molecule or atom is identical to every other molecule or atom. So you can, if it's a mixture, you can change the ratio of the various components. I'm going to go back for a second and come and then I'll go back uh, forward. For instance, you can't change the ratio of oxygen to hydrogen in pure water. It's always two to one, right? But if you have oxygen gas and hydrogen gas mixed together, you can add more hydrogen gas and now all of a sudden you've changed that ratio. So that's the difference between a compound and a mixture is a mixture is variable. A pure substance is not. A pure substance always has the same ratio. Um, so for instance, any metal that's not on the periodic table is actually a mixture. So for instance, brass is a mixture of copper and zinc. Steel is a mixture of iron and cobalt and a few other compounds or a few other elements. Um, and generally the difference is that they're physically mixed together. So basically you stirred things up until everything was, was nicely mixed. And that 
but they're not chemically attached to each other. Um, mixtures can be made up of elements or they can be made up of compounds or both. So the atmosphere is a good example of that. Our atmosphere is a mixture of a bunch of different compounds and elements. You've got elemental oxygen and nitrogen. You've got sulfur dioxide. You've got water. You've got carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, water, those are all compounds. But if you had just water, you, or water we already used as itself, if you had pure solid CO2, that would, could be a pure substance. But when you take that and you mix it into the atmosphere, now we have a mixture. And as we know, we can adjust the value, the amount of any of the components in our atmosphere. For instance, up until the Industrial Revolution, sulfur dioxide wasn't present in our atmosphere in measurable quantities unless there was a massive volcano going off uh, somewhere in the world. Um, now, however, there's large amounts of sulfur, not large amounts, relatively large amounts of sulfur dioxide present everywhere that you have internal combustion engines. Um, and so I know we're done here and we'll go over that in more detail and practice with that later, but I wanted to show you another cool site. Um, that I always can never remember the name of it, but if I if you Google Earth Wind Map, um, you get this website that gives you a a um, 3D model of Earth with uh, live wind speeds on it, which doesn't seem like it's all that closely related to what we were just talking about, except for if you go down to the bottom here, you can actually look at specific chemicals um, that are tracked by NASA. Um, and this is all scraping data from NASA satellite sources. Um, so we can actually look at the concentration of sulfur dioxide um, in, in the air in real time. All of those reddish areas, um, almost all of those reddish areas are going to be coal power plants. You can see how the wind is sort of driving the reddish streaks along with it. You see it up here as well. So those coal power plants are emitting sulfur dioxide, which is then being dragged by the um, wind along, along wherever it's going, which is why sometimes, despite not having that many cars up here, we can have hazy days. Um, when the wind is just right, we get all the pollution from, from the Bay Area and from Sacramento. Um, but the other cool thing about, the thing that's cooler about sulfur dioxide is, I guess it's, it's cool the other way too, but it's a little depressing. Um, you can also use it to track active volcanoes. So you can actually see Mauna Loa on Hawaii is this little red spot right there. Um, and I don't know if that eruption in Iceland is still active, but it looks like it hasn't settled down completely. Look how dark that little, that, uh, little swath right there is off Iceland. That's 100% that's, that's the volcano that uh, erupted, what, two weeks ago now? Um, still, still emitting sulfur dioxide. So this is just a fun, something fun to play around with. It also has ocean currents and you can um, sort things as, so there you're looking at ocean currents and you can also look at the surface temperature anomaly, which is the difference from average uh, of the surface temperature of the ocean. So obviously red and yellow is bad. Um, means it's warmer than normal and blue is cooler than normal for this day historically in uh, the calendar year. Um, and so you can see if we zoom out, there's a lot more red and yellow than there is blue um, because ocean temperatures are rising. So anyway, um, on that depressing note, uh, we will end the lecture today. Uh, I will um, be in the lab session, section two, if you have any questions about lab, and I'll give you guys, um, those of you who weren't in lab on Monday, a brief intro um, in, let's say, 10 minutes since I went a little over again. So 335, um, we'll have lab.